Back in 1984, Chrysler's Dodge division resurrected a name from their Mopar muscle car past, the Daytona, to be a new sports car to rival the Camaro and Mustang. But although this new Daytona was really just a modified Chrysler K-Car in disguise, it slowly evolved over its 10-year run and distanced itself from its humble K-Car origins. This is a story of the Dodge Daytona. This is my old car. The fantastically balanced, performance-bred Dodge Daytona Turbo Z. When you hear the name Dodge Daytona, depending on your age, you may think of the Dodge Charger Daytona built in 1969 as a limited edition version of the Charger built solely to win NASCAR races. This special Charger was heavily modified with an aerodynamic nose cone and a massive rear wing. Its 440 horsepower V8 was so powerful in fact that NASCAR actually banned it due to it having such an unfair advantage. As a result, it only lasted that one production year. The very similar Plymouth Superbird followed it with just one year of production in 1970. Or, if you are slightly younger, you may remember the Dodge Charger Daytona of the mid-70s, which sadly drifted significantly from what the Daytona name once was. This Charger Daytona was just a rebadged Chrysler Cordoba, and its land yacht dimensions and tendency to guzzle gas quickly became a liability, shortening its model run to only three years, from 1975 to 1977. Or, if you were even younger than that, you may remember the Dodge Ram Daytona. It was a special trim level and Dodge Ram pickup in 2005, with a hood scoop just like a Dodge Ram SRT10, except it had a 5.7 liter Hemi V8 instead of a V10, and a big spoiler as a nod to the 69 Charger Daytona. The car that the 84 Daytona replaced was another revered name in Dodge history, the Challenger. However, it too had completely lost its way, with the Challenger name having been tacked on to a Mitsubishi import. Ironically, the Daytona's replacement in 1995 was a Dodge Avenger, which was also built by Mitsubishi. The 84 Daytona was built on what Chrysler called the G platform, which was derived from the K platform that was best known for cars like the Dodge Aries and Plymouth Reliant. But unlike those boring, boxy commuter cars, the Daytona was intended to be a more sporty alternative. However, its base engine option, a 2.2 liter naturally aspirated four cylinder, only made 93 horsepower. An upgraded 2.2 liter turbo was also offered with 146 horsepower and was known as the Turbo Z. The Z possibly meant to compare it against the Nissan Z model of the same era. The Turbo Z impressed Car and Driver magazine enough to add it to its 10 best list in 1984. They praised it as a better alternative to GM's Camaro and Firebird, despite the fact that the Daytona was front wheel drive, which would typically be a detriment to any real sports car. As was typical for all the big three automakers of the 80s, the Daytona had a badge engineered clone called the Chrysler Laser, which also debuted in 1984. The Laser was billed as the Chrysler brand first sports car and was intended to be an upscale Daytona, but it really was just a copy of the Daytona's upper trim levels. This iteration of the Laser lasted less than three years, with just over 147,000 units sold, ending halfway through the 1986 model year. Its short life was due to the Chrysler LeBaron Coupe having been restyled for 1987 such that it took over the market that the Laser once held. The Laser name would be resurrected in 1990 but moved to the Plymouth brand where it was a virtual twin to the Eagle Talon and Mitsubishi Eclipse. All three were made by Diamond Star Motors, a joint venture between Chrysler and Mitsubishi. If you're from Canada, you may better remember the Daytona not branded as a Dodge but instead as a Chrysler. After the Laser ended production in 1986, the Daytona was exported to Canada as the Chrysler Daytona, and it continued to be branded as a Chrysler all the way until the end of the Daytona production in 1993. During its 10-year run, there really was only one generation of the Dodge Daytona, since its platform remained relatively unchanged across all 10 years. However, it had two notable refreshes, the first in 1987 and the second in 1992. The 1987 refresh had a new front fascia with pop-up headlamps. It also offered a new Pacifica trim package, which included leather seats and an eight-way power driver's seat. 1987 also marked the first year of the optional Shelby Z package that upgraded the 2.2-liter turbo to 174 horsepower. Despite its name, legendary car designer Carroll Shelby had no input on the Daytona design. He simply allowed Dodge to put his name on it. Starting in 1990, a 3.0-liter V6 was offered, and in 1991, a new trim called the IROC, as in the International Race of Champions, was available. The Shelby name was still used on some models, but was phased out over the next two years, following the end of Carroll Shelby's involvement with Chrysler. Starting in 1992, the Daytona had another facelift, with the pop-ups replaced with more conventional flush-mounted headlamps and a more rounded rear end 
with new taillight design. The loss of the pop-up headlamps was most likely a cost-cutting measure as opposed to a style choice, since the pop-up headlamp fad was still popular in the early 90s, especially with the C4 and C5 Corvettes keeping them alive through 2004. The IROC was also available with an RT performance package with an upgraded 2.2 liter turbo 4 producing 224 horsepower. I used to own a 92 Daytona in the ES trim which had the exact same styling as the IROC model and the same V6 engine. Visually there was no real difference except for the V6 replacing the IROC badge on the front quarter panels and the ES replacing the IROC badge on the rear. I first saw the Daytona at the 92 Detroit Auto Show, and what drew me to it was not so much the outside, but instead the layout of the dashboard. My previous car, a 1990 Pontiac Sunbird, had several of the controls set in a cowl around the steering wheel so that they could be easily accessed without fully taking your hands off the wheel. The 92 Daytona had a very similar design. In fact, the 92 Daytona didn't even have control stocks attached to the steering column. You would expect at least one for the turn signal, but instead it was a little lever protruding from the left side of the dash. I should also point out that the ground effects on the lower portion of the doors proved to be detrimental for my Daytona. The bad thing about ground effects such as these is that they had to be shaped to avoid rubbing against the door opening. Unfortunately for my Daytona, they were just a bit too large, or maybe they were put on wrong in the factory. Soon after I brought home my new red 92 Daytona ES, the body cladding on the passenger side kept rubbing against the door opening, so much so that anyone trying to get in or out could not open the door all the way, and eventually it started to break off. I had to take it back to the dealer, who didn't have a replacement part on hand, so they had to cut a gaping hole in the body cladding, which of course looked awful until the new part finally came in. Had I known I would be doing these videos years later, I would have taken a photo. Despite this setback, it wasn't the reason I gave up the car two years later. That was due to the arrival of my firstborn son. The back seats in the Daytona really weren't meant for anyone of normal size, and trying to get a baby seat back there simply wasn't going to work. Three months after my son was born, I traded in the Daytona for the type of vehicle my wife insisted we needed, a Dodge Caravan. These were the first generation caravans, which was about equal to death for any car lover. I begrudgingly accepted it, but soon grew to hate it with such a passion that I sold it only about a year later. I had it for such a short time that I won't be included in this video series, but its replacement was another Dodge product that will be the topic of my next episode. If you liked what you saw here, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel. If you used to own a car from the 80s to early 2000s that you almost never see today and would like to see it showcased in a future episode, put a reply in the comments or email me at the address shown here. See you next time.